So Dr. Wiener, when uh, Baltimore City is probably the city or the, the jurisdiction that's most recently been in the news around health and well-being and other things. Uh, and Don Edwards from Alameda County, I, I think there's probably no other county uh, or, or group that's generated more information over a long, a long period of time in terms of social determinants, how that affects health, and the, than the work uh, of Alameda. So I think we would have a really great start to kick us off for our next steps. Uh, so some of you know Dakota Tribal Wisdom says, when you discover you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. However, those of us interested in interoperability, or social determinants, or end social determinants in health, we love our dead horses. Uh, in Maryland, we point committees, we send out for crabs, and we study dead horses. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, again, may maybe if we just had some more money, the, the horse wouldn't be so dead. Uh, or, you know, maybe we, you know, I talked about on, on Monday, we connect the, you know, connect the dots. Well, if we can connect these dead horses, somehow that's going to be solving the problem. Uh, uh, often, uh, maybe we need uh, seminars, and hopefully today is not a seminar on increasing riding ability of dead horses. Or, you know, it's a standard issue. We just need to have different standards for our dead horses, and then, they, then something would happen. Uh, or we do site visits to each other to see, you know, are our dead, maybe their horse is less dead than our horse. Uh, and then luckily for us academics, a popular strategy is to get consultants to tell you about dead horses. Uh, <laughs> So, so what I'm really excited about for the last two days and what we're moving into today, today is I, I think, again, people are really trying to figure out, you know, what do we know that we want to continue? Again, not everything we've been doing for a while needs to get changed. But as often has been talked about, uh, we, there are some changes, whether it's changes in technology that we need to adapt to, changes in interoperability, and not just the data, but how do we actually work better together? Uh, and, and I think, again, as the, this, this, uh, the tenth session is bringing more of the social determinants, that really provides us some opportunities to understand how we can be going through together. Uh, now, this is actually a ten-year-old uh, picture from Baltimore City, so it's not the recent uprising. But I, I do this to point out that, you know, there's a lot of hurt people out there. And hurt people hurt people, whether it's issues of interpersonal violence, uh, and spousal violence, or children uh, who have been subject to, to abuse and neglect, uh, or uh, individuals who haven't been given opportunities just because of where they were born, uh, and therefore the economic and social and other opportunities are not the same uh, as in other communities. Uh, and they establish networks for supporting each other. Uh, they do those things, but we in, who are involved in services, whether it's health services or social support services, are often disconnected. And one of the things that's increasingly becoming an issue with greater inequities in income in, 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 in the United States, uh, not just general inequities, but people who are not living near each other with huge discrepancies, means that the assets that we have, the people in this room have, Yes, we have great health care, but we really get along because of our social support systems, our informational networks, our, our, whether they're our neighbors, or the people we work with, and as we are many of the communities that we're working with, we have really very sparse, not just in financial resources, but the access to information, uh, access to transportation, access to all these things are much sparser there, which means that a much less slight can get you off the pathway to success. Uh, again, this is 10 years old. It's not the recent uprising. This is not the first time Baltimore's come together. Uh, this was a family who was reporting on drug users. Uh, this is actually a second firebomb that got thrown into their house. The first firebomb didn't go off. Uh, uh, a day later, they came back and uh, the mother, father, and five children died. Uh, again, Baltimore has come together in the past. Uh, and I think one of the challenges, and the nation is coming together. Again, this is, I, I think the issue of Baltimore is an example, is, is Baltimore is an example, but it's an example of inequities and challenges that many, if not most, of our jurisdictions are, are encountering. So how do we get around these? Uh, it's not, you know, we've had uh, lieutenant governors and congressmen and, and state senators come together in the past. Uh, on, on Monday, when I stepped in quickly, I pointed out that a few miles apart in Baltimore City, we have people living more than 20 years longer in terms of our average life expectancy than other neighborhoods. Some of the neighborhoods where they're living in have some of the best health, not just medical, but health institutions in the world in terms of Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland, yet we still have these huge inequities in health services. So again, it's not just an issue of availability, it's how do we 
get our access, get them acceptable, and, and, and as we've been talking about, how data can be useful. Uh, it's also important to, to recognize that at different stages of our lives, there's different institutions that are important for us. I mean, early on, it's really the family of orientation and to some extent our parents, neighbors. Then schools become critically important as opportunities uh, for ourselves as, our as when we're children and then for our children. Uh, peer groups then take on increasing importance than where you're working, these other assets. And I think as we've been talking about population health and other things, we're really moving away from somehow it's a physician and a healthcare visit that's going to be fixing things. It really is coming up with a new way of supporting individuals in their community, connecting these things together that we need involving work and human resources uh, and employment and, and, and insurance uh, and, and, and other kind of things. Uh, again, just pointing out that there's a lot of data on adverse childhood experiences. Uh, these are some of the adverse childhood experiences for Baltimore City, Maryland, and, and for the nation. And again, Baltimore is just an example. Many of you who are coming from urban areas have very high rates of adverse childhood experiences in there. Uh, we also know that this is also related to poverty. So uh, 400 or more above the uh, poverty level, much lower rates of either one or two or more adverse life effects. Uh, if you're at the poverty level or within 100% of that, uh, over half of the people, 65% of the individuals are experiencing one or more adverse life effects. And we know, again, these are early childhood life effects that have a long-term consequence, both for individual effects, but then how people parent and other opportunities that they're going to able to have. So with that as an introduction, uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Lena Wen. Uh, you, you met Josh Sharstein uh, on, on, er, earlier. He presided one of the sessions. And uh, we've been fortunate in, in Baltimore to have some great health commissioners, but each one seems to be getting a little bit better. And, and we're really amazed about what Dr. Wen has been able to do just in less than six months that she's been the health commissioner here uh, in terms of really mobilizing and supporting work that was going on, but also really refocusing us and, and bringing us together in a very different way. So I think you will really enjoy hearing her today. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Thank you very much, Dr. Leaf. And it's a very kind introduction, but I also think it sets the bar too high. So let's lower the expectations for us to start with. You know, Baltimore has been in the news so much recently and all, pretty much all in bad ways. Right? I mean, we've been hearing about the two Baltimores, the life expectancies that differ by 20 years, about how you know, lead pain, all these issues that have been building up. And what I want to do is, I know that the conference today for a series of changes about interoperability and what we can do with data and data sharing and technology. I want to start with telling you a story, because I'm an ER doctor, and everything that I do goes back to the stories of my patients. And I want to use this story as a way to illustrate five lessons that I'd like for us to, maybe not to take away, because I'm not sure that I have the final answer in any way, but at least as a starting point for thinking through five concepts. So I want to tell you about my patient, Sean, who is 17 years old. And he's coming to the ER because of gunshot wounds. Not one or two or three gunshot wounds, but five gunshot wounds. He was shot three times in the chest and twice in the abdomen. Now, when he came into the ER, he already wasn't breathing. We could barely feel a pulse, could not get a blood pressure. And we knew what to do, right? Because we immediately began to resuscitate him. And we started giving him blood and fluids and inserted a chest tube and even went so far as to crack open his chest and massage his heart. While we were in the process of resuscitating him, we looked at his charts. And what we had in his medical record was that he had been in and out of our hospital over the course of many years that this is someone who, even though he's 17, was in the ER at least five times in the last year for other injuries related to violence, punching someone, breaking his hand, being assaulted, being stabbed, also many visits for alcohol, cocaine, intoxication, and many other notes documenting his psychiatric illness and how he had depression and bipolar and was on all kinds of drugs and was homeless and was exposed to lead paint as a child and also had many encounters with Department of Social Service, Department of Juvenile Service, basically everything in the book. And so for us in the ER that day, my thought was, well, yes, we should intervene and we should do everything we can at that moment for our patient. But where is that moment that we could have intervened before? Was it during those various ER visits 
Were there other opportunities that we could have identified this child as someone at risk? You know, one of the most depressing parts of my job is I chair a committee called Child Fatality Review, CFR. And Child Fatality Review is a state-mandated committee where we look at every single case of a child who died in Baltimore City. And perhaps the most depressing part about Child Fatality Review, because you have everyone sitting around the table, right? You have the police department and state's attorney's office and DJS and DSS and health department and every home visiting service. And what we'll find in nearly every single case of a child who died, regardless of whether it's a youth who was shot or an eight-month-old who died in their sleep, the sad thing is you can almost predict that it was going to happen before that child died because very rarely was it ever that child's one encounter was that encounter where they died, but nearly all the time there were sheets this thick from every agency reporting on what happened to this child. And so one of the things that I would love for us to tackle and the first lesson is just how can we begin to share that information with every agency prior to the point that that child died? We have a state mandate saying that all these parties can come together to share data for child fatality review, which is a review of what happens after that child has died. What is it that we can do before that? Right? How, can we, um, how can we eliminate the legal barriers in the same way so that we're not just addressing these children after they've died, so that we're not just addressing my patient at the moment that they're dying of a gunshot wound in the ER or five gunshot wounds in the ER. And what we are finding in child fatality review is that often there are so many barriers that people will say, and as you've heard during this conference, I'm sure, so many times that people will say, well, this is the law, and we can't do it because of HIPAA and FERPA and all these things, but actually, how much can we do just with an Excel sheet alone? What is it that we can do, even if I can't share data with, because of FERPA and HIPAA with the, with the schools? But what if we can just, what if I can just talk to DSS directly? What if I can talk to the school superintendent directly? What is it that we can do so that we can overcome those structural barriers so that we do identify the people most at risk before that point? So the first, my first lesson perhaps is that we actually should be doing our best to not say no and to instead look at the opportunities and to not let legal barriers be in our way because often these legal barriers aren't real and are things that are there because that's what we hear. That's the easy answer. And I see this in the ER all the time, that often we'll have patients coming in and we'll call another hospital and say, we need to know this patient's creatinine because this patient is here, the creatinine is 3.5. I'm going to have to keep this person in the hospital unless you tell me that that's actually not new. And people will cite HIPAA, they'll cite all these reasons, but these are not actually real legal reasons at the end of the day. Now, one of the other issues that troubles me on a daily basis is that of behavioral health. Now, behavioral health, meaning substance addiction, mental health, we have Amanda Lattimore here in our audience who is our, um, or here in this conference, who is our new director of social epidemiology for Behavioral Health System Baltimore, which is our behavioral health authority in the city, and is helping us to look into this issue. And, you know, one of the problems that we had coming in is that people always use these numbers when talking about Baltimore. You've heard of this, that we have 60,000 people with addiction in the city. 60,000 is completely nuts. We have a city of 620,000 people, population. 60,000 with addictions, is this, is this a real number? I'm not sure. But having those numbers, having those concrete numbers really helps us. We've been talking about for a long time that, look, there are those of us who believe that we don't have enough slots for mental health and substance abuse treatment. Right? We believe that that's the case because we know that there are many individuals who will seek treatment but who are unable to get slots. We don't have treatment on demand by a long shot, which makes no sense. If you overdose today and you know that you need to seek treatment and you go to seek treatment, you cannot be told that the next slot that, that's available to you is in two months. How is that going to help you today when you're going to be withdrawing in six hours? How is that going to help you today when your motivation is today? So we know that there are big issues with our treatment capacity. But unless we can demonstrate that with numbers, unless we can say this is what happens when a patient walks in with this type of insurance and this is what they're facing, then we're not really making a difference at the end of the day. Then we're going to be encountering many other individuals who are the NIMBY folks, or not the not in my backyard folks, who will say, I see drug treatment centers everywhere. We don't need any more. 
but how much more powerful would it be for us to say, here are our data. Here's what we're seeing in the city. Here's how long this patient has to wait. So I think there's significant power in data if we're able to harness it, even, on a, even in a very specific policy orientation, as, as in this example. My third idea is for us to leverage what we have, leverage the systems that are already in place. Now, I know that you heard from Dr. Sharfstein and from others about the system that we have in Maryland, CRISP which is our medical record system for the state and for our region. I pr previously practiced in DC, and we were so jealous of the Maryland system that we actually all used CRISP in, uh, in, my, uh, in, in my hospital at, at George Washington University because that was how we were getting data about our patients in the DC area and in Maryland. And CRISP offers so many potentials for us. One of the projects that we're looking into, for example, is to identify where it is and how it is that people are falling here in the area. If we can get real-time data on where it is that people are falling, let's say that we find that they're all falling in the same senior building. Instead of targeting our interventions on the back end and saying, let's do hip implants, let's focus on what happens when people, get, um, when, when people go into nursing, um, nursing homes and rehab, how about let's fix those light fixtures? Let's change, maybe there's something wrong with this public housing and their elevator has been broken for, for two months. I mean, how can we target interventions on the front end? So leveraging those systems that we have and thinking creatively instead of creating new, instead of coming up with new ones is another concept that I, I hope that we'll keep in mind as well. The fourth idea, and maybe one that's going to be a bit antithetical to everyone here, is that not always are high-tech solutions the answer? And sometimes we have to focus on the most low-tech solutions of all. You know, one of the projects that we focus on in the health department, we see violence as a public health issue. And you know, I know that it's not only a public health issue, certainly it would be folly for us, for me to say, the health department has to solve the problem of homicides in the city. That would make no sense. And certainly police department and criminal justice and other systems play a role. But we do know that violence is something that is contagious, that it is something that spreads from person to person. It is something that there is a cycle of violence and hopelessness and incarceration and mental health issues and substance addiction. How can we break that cycle? And so together with Dr. Leaf and other partners at Hopkins and throughout the city, we have four sites across the city called Safe Streets. This is based off of the national cure violence model that violence is contagious. And so we hire ex-offenders, many of whom were former gang leaders and drug, um, and drug dealers, to be the individuals to literally walk the streets every day. And they interrupt violence where it occurs. Last year, they mediated 880 violent conflicts, more than 80% of which were likely or very likely to result in gun violence. That's a very low-tech intervention. And yes, we do use things like geomapping um, and to look at where it is that violence is happening. We do use data to help us guide our hotspotting, our techniques that Jeff Brenner and others have, 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 have pioneered. But ultimately, the solutions that are low-tech are also things that we cannot forget in our search for high-tech, high-data, high-powered solutions as well. And I'll end with one more final thought, the last idea, last lesson, if you will. And that relates back to what Dr. Leaf was saying and how he opened um, our, 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 our day in the first place, which is that there is this big elephant in the room of what happened here in Baltimore two months ago. And in no way would I or any of us ever say that what happened was a good thing, because of course it wasn't. That violence and the unrest and all the harm that was done to our city will result in, it has resulted in millions of dollars of damage and just and a lot of loss of trust in our systems and our leadership in a way that might be irreparable for some time to come. But I do think that what happened in the city offers us a really unique opportunity to address public health in a way that we may never have again. I mean, I look, and I look at the news coverage that happened in the wake of the unrest, and maybe ever since Hurricane Katrina, I can't recall a time when public health was this much in the news. I mean, talking about lead poisoning, talking about life expectancy differences, talking about social determinants of health. In every major news publication, I mean, we have this 
I think, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really address the underlying inputs for what got us here in the first place. And yes, we should talk about violence. Yes, we should talk about you know, wrecks and parks and increasing opportunities for youth and all these things that immediately come to mind when we think about why the unrest happened. But I also think that this is a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-generation chance for us to really look at the root causes of what got us here and to think about how can we address mental health? How can we address substance abuse? When we look at our, our, our population in our jails, eight out of 10 people use illegal substances. Four out of 10 in our jails have diagnosed mental illness. What is it that we're doing to address this most vulnerable population? Baltimore City has always been a pioneer when it comes to place-based care and looking at where people are, not just saying, well, yes, it would be ideal if everybody went to get, if every child got immunizations with their PCP and got lead testing by their PCP. I mean, it would be great if that all happened. But in that absence of that happening, we've always been a pioneer when it comes to delivering care where people are, visiting people in their homes, visiting pregnant moms in their homes to teach about safe sleep. We are one of the pioneers. School-based health centers are delivering care in schools, reproductive health and LARCs in schools. We were a pioneer. Needle exchange, so many places across the country that still this is a political football. For us, we've been doing needle exchange for over 20 years and have distributed literally millions and millions of syringes and needles. And that is not a political issue for us in the city because it's something that we know to be right and evidence-based. And so how can we leverage the opportunity that we have to address core underlying issues and to build on the innovative solutions that we know are evidence-based? I think that's the opportunity for us in Baltimore, but also the opportunity for so many other jurisdictions and communities around the country. So with that, I wish to thank you for your time, your attention, your, your focus on this really important issue, and look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, I think we're just going to move to, to Don, uh, but I, I did take to correct uh, Dr. Wen, but I don't think I had uh, too high of a bar. Uh, and and, and I, again, I, as, as emphasizing that this, this is an example for many jurisdictions because it, you know you can just go any place in the country, and it's not just the uprising, but it's the discussions now of the inequities, the other solutions, and the fact that some people have been again, we'll get into this hopefully a little bit, that there have been efforts that actually in certain neighborhoods actually that they didn't sort of blow up because there were things going on there, the reduction of low birth weights and the number of successful births, which has translated into more children entering our schools ready to learn. They, they, these are not just sort of interventions that just only have an impact during a short period of time, but really help us break the cycle. And so now, as, as I pointed out, you know, Alameda study, the studies in Alameda County and the efforts in Alameda County have really been at the forefront of our understanding what can get done and documenting some of the positive outcomes. So we're really privileged to have Don here today. Thank you, Philip. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the um, uh, Stewards of Change for their 10 years of leadership and advocacy to improve the lives of those most in need. Um, second, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to the 2015 Warriors <laughs> NBA. <laughs> 2009, Oscar Grant, Oakland, California. 2012, Trayvon Martin, Sanford, Florida. 2014, Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri. 2014, Nikki, Aki Gurley, New York, New York. 2015, Freddie Gray, Baltimore, Maryland. So what do they all have in common? Of course, they all died in confrontation with the, uh, with the police, and in one case, a wannabe police. But they also ignited conversation and anger across the nation. But the other thing that they did was they woke up America to start talking about the social economic de determinants that put these five people at risk, at deadly risk. And witness today, this is what we're talking about. 
topic number one, stewards of change. A famous comedian in the slash uh, advocate in the 60s and 70s, Dick Gregory once said, America is beautiful, but to improve America, you gotta, you gotta talk about some of the bad things in America too. So I wanna talk about the beauty of Alameda County, but some of the bad things too. It, Alameda County has some of the highest incomes, uh, highest property values, beautiful lakes, lots of trees, rolling brown hills. <laughs> 10 miles from San Francisco, 30 miles from Silicon Valley, great place to live. Yet, we have pockets of high poverty where life expectancy is far below the average. This is Oakland, where I live. And Oakland is divided into the have and have nots. So if you live in the hills, even in the lower hills, you have high income, you have high property values, you have uh, high uh, educational uh, uh, schools, you have um, high life expectancy. But if you live in East or West Oakland, you have high crime, you have high poverty, you have high school dropouts, and you have high rates of death due to homicide and unintentional injuries. So if you live in East Oakland, and you're an African-American child, you're going to live maybe 70. If you can get past 24, where 82% of our children die from homicide and uh, unintentional injuries. Of course, if you live in the hills, you're gonna have a nice life, and you may even die of cancer. So why can't people in Oakland in the east and west parts of Oakland live like the people in the hills? Why can't they have great parks instead of bad parks? Why can't they have safe neighborhoods instead of high crime neighborhoods? Why do they have so many fast food restaurants in our poor neighborhoods? Why do they have so many liquor stores on every corner? In east and west Oakland, they live next to the highways and they live next to the freeways, I mean to the uh, airports into the railroads. There are no banks, and the, the people that lend the money also uh, have the highest interest rates. It's a predatory lenders. So if you live in the worst parts of Oakland, as an infant, you're two times more likely to be born at low birth weight. You're 12 times less likely to have a mother who graduated from college. By the time you're four, you're 13 times more likely to live in poverty, four times less likely to read at grade level. As an adult, you're five times more likely to be unemployed and three times more likely to die of a stroke. How many of you have heard of moonshots? Uh, I'm sorry, those of you who are not Google or anyone named Shell. <laughs> so Google is uh, organizing a, a program across the country where they are partnering with um, communities to to change the paradigm of thinking about how you can make things happen. And the moonshot basically comes from Kennedy's idea of let's go to the moon. Not because it's easy to do, but because it's hard to do. So the moonshot is the thing that you would do if, if you had your best wish. Well, in Alameda, we're working with Google and we have identified five moonshots. The first one is education and jobs. The second one that I'll talk about more is uh, safe communities. This is the project that I'm working on. The third one is service improvement. 
And the fourth is health, hunger, and housing, where we have, where we want hunger-free, healthy communities in which all residents have affordable and decent housing. And the fifth is emergency preparedness. The second innovation project that the one that I'm working on is called Safe Communities. And we've named it Rebuilding Our Communities in Alameda, Rock AC. And our vision is Alameda residents, all Alameda residents live in thriving and stable communities. All residents have housing and food. All residents, East and West Oakland, feel safe in their homes, have great schools and neighborhoods. All families, youth and children, are healthy and physically, physically active. And all families and community members support the learning of our schools. And we have some strategies. Universal case management, the collection of all of the tools that provide all the services to our communities, changing our, our paradigm of thinking for healthy, wealthy, and wise talk. Live Well San Diego is a great example of that. A no wrong door, regardless of which door you walk in, you can get the service you need no matter whether you walk through the right door or the wrong door. And we're looking for, we're going to identify some empowerment zones where we can prove that this is possible. So in our empowerment zones, we're going to adopt a, com a community to invest and test the collaborative services and the interventions. This is based on the Promise Neighborhood model. Uh, we'll be collecting data to identify that community, services targeted to community residents, including those re-entering the community, community court concept so that we can start clearing out some of the, the uh, records of some of the, the, the people coming out of incarceration. And we want to pay these individuals to go to work and to go to school. And we want to use our realignment funds as an incentive for local business to invest in our people in those communities. So in these, in these apartment zones, we will have places for children to go, recreation centers, uh, legal, uh, legal uh, attorneys, uh, places for learning how to get, uh, get new jobs, vocational training. And we also had to identify, so where are these resources are going to come from? Of course, from Alameda County employees, our innovation pro, uh, funds. Uh, it's going to take a lot of political will. And so our, our political leaders are working ne right next to us with this. And of course, technology, interoperable tools, and predictive analytics. Uh, but also our partners, ex our external partners, uh, and, and stakeholders in our community, and philanthropic, and, and state and federal entities. And to get that data, we want to ask some questions. So who lives in Alameda County? So we want the demographic data. What is the health profile of the community? So what, you know, life expectancy and uh, primary causes of death. Uh, which neighborhoods are most affected by the environments that we're talking about today? So all of that data together identifies how we will make uh, this, this program come, come to life. And some other questions, uh, what crimes are occurring within Alameda? Uh, how is school quality? Uh, who, is presented, who is presently engaged in criminal justice systems? And then getting the data to support all of that helps us identify that community. And when we do that, 
We know that we'll be able to increase the, eco the economic stability and provide opportunity, uh, increase housing and stability and affordability, and prevent violence. Thank you. So now we're going to open this up to the audience. Um, just, there's some mics out there. People, uh, you want to see the mic? Thanks very much. Gardner from Children and Family Futures in California. Um, two very brief reactions to both of the both of the comments. One reaction focusing on heroin, and one on history. Um, Dr. Wynn was quoted in a recent Nick Kristoff column uh, echoing some of the things she said today about substance abuse, um, but in that particular quote saying that heroin was one of the critical issues in Baltimore. And um, I, I think that's a crucial issue in talking about interoperability because substance abuse, illegal drugs in general, is at the center of the health system, the behavioral health system that she talked about, social services and social determinants, and of course the criminal justice system. And to put those pieces together is rare and difficult and requires data that's usually not there. And my thesis in this first point is that often it's the missing data that's much more important than the data that we have. We're sometimes so impressed with new technology and what we referred to yesterday and captured on one of the charts as a tidal wave of data that we forget that the missing data can be the most important potential for interoperability. Um, we in California would welcome tidal waves at this point, but we have drought. Um, but some of you around the country where it rains and where there's a lot of water have data droughts. But if you only focus on the data that's available, you will only come up with conclusions about that information. Substance abuse and the crosswalk between child abuse is a crucial area. There's federal legislation that guides states and localities to report every to refer every drug affected birth to child protective services, not for purposes of removal, but so that that mom can get into treatment. The numbers reported to the federal government are not monitored by the federal government, or not reported annually, and most of your jurisdictions report numbers so low no one in your states or localities believe them. Ask when you go home, if you don't know the number, how many substance exposed births are were in your jurisdiction. You will not believe the number. Some of the states and localities in this conference report as required annually when asked how many of the kids removed were affected by parental substance abuse, how many of the kids removed to foster care, that critical bridge between health and social services, how many of those kids removed were affected by parental substance abuse, some of your jurisdictions report 0%. A very large state that will be nameless, Pacific facing with 38 million people, <laughs> reports that 9% of the foster care removals in that state were affected by parental substance abuse. No one believes that. There's a state here that reports zero, there's a county here that reports zero. Why is that important? You can't coordinate what you don't count. Missing data matters. That is one of the critical bridges. Second point, um, inevitably uh, a point that senior citizens tend to make, so if you're over 60, you can tune out. If you're over 70, get an early nap. <laughs> but we didn't start trying to coordinate health and social services last year or even 10 years ago. There's a lot of history, decades of history, in each of your communities. We have invented a new science recently called Implementation Science. The best article, the best book ever written on implementation was done on Oakland 40 or 50 years ago. So it, let us at least resolve to make new mistakes. Let us resolve the, the coordination problems and attempts, the failures and successes of the past, will be part of our background work rather than launching new coordinative, interoperable, integrative efforts without any notion that these things didn't start a decade ago. 
we made some important mistakes. We also made some important progress. It might be helpful to consult those earlier efforts and see what worked and what didn't. When there's federal legislation on the books that most states and localities ignore, when there are memoranda of understanding that the participants don't implement, figuring out why that is, rather than assuming that those policy issuances are real, requires a knowledge of recent history and sometimes even older history. I apologize for the ancient nature of that note, but it's a point that I think needs making. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take one more comment and then we'll let, let uh, Mina and Don respond. Good morning. I uh, uh, was scribbling frantically while you all were talking, making notes. Uh, there are a couple of points. Um, the, uh, the young man that Dr. Wynn referenced, um, I think it was an important, important point that you mentioned the chart that was there from early childhood to age 17. And um, it was interesting that nobody had seen that until that time when we all know that people were looking at that chart every time the person came in. So that, that being able to see and actually absorb what you're looking at uh, is something that I think we sometimes miss um, either because we're so busy or because uh, we don't have the information at hand as quickly as we need it. The, uh, the other piece around seeing, and, and several people mentioned, you both, I think you both mentioned, and Phil, I think you did too, um, People who aren't in uh, the disinvested communities, like Don mentioned, um, don't focus so much as people who live in the other areas, uh, like on Phil's uh, chart about Baltimore and where people live. Um, we have, as you said, we have drug treatment centers everywhere. We see them everywhere, so what's the problem? Well, they're seeing what they want to see. So uh, in a quote, and I'm going to quote Maria Shriver, but um, her quote was, um, change how you see and then see how you change. Because if you look at it from a different perspective, I truly believe that we quit focusing so much on our, our particular lane that we're living in and we start to look outside at the actual people that are around us. So that, that's one point. Um, the other, I really like the moonshot. I think that's a, a, a great thing. Um, I'm probably gonna take that back with me. The, um, the paradigm shift is important. It has to happen. Uh, it has to happen as a community. It can't happen over in the health agency or over in the criminal justice agency or uh, at the local country club in Oakland. Um, it, you know, it, it has to happen across a community. So it's a community-wide effort. Um, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I think that's worth saying again or reminding people of. It also is not easy work. And people tend to, uh, I noticed in my years in, in uh, children's services that uh, given an easy path, people would take it every time. This is hard work and it takes a lot of dedication and commitment. It doesn't happen quickly, it happens over time. Hence the importance on the data and tying that piece together so that people don't lose their uh, encouragement about moving forward and keeping going on a forward track to make the moonshot. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, do you, um, Lena or Don, either of you want to respond? Or? So I first want to thank the, the both of you for your really astute observations and comments. Heroin and history, I mean, very, um, you know, very, um, very well said. Um, want to make just a couple of, of, of comments in response. The first is about the chart, the medical record. So in my previous role, I was the director of patient-centered care research at George Washington University and a practicing ER doctor. And I thought a lot about these issues, about the issue of charting. Because while we're, for, uh, for, for example, let's go back to drugs and prescription drug abuse. We know that that's a huge problem in our country, right? That the 2009 data, even from 2009, showed that we are prescribing about 230 million prescription narcotics every year in the US. 
that's one prescription for every American, every adult American. I mean, that's crazy. Is it possible that we as a country are in that much pain, that we need that many narcotics? I mean, we are 5% of the world's population. We use 80% of the world's narcotics. I mean, that's crazy. And as an ER doctor, I know that at the same time, we're under extreme pressure in terms of time. And on an average eight-hour shift, I would see between 40 and 60 patients. And so for everything that, you, that would require an extra click, that's time that I don't have. And so even after we started having PDMPs and the ability to look up people's medical records, back to the issue about Sean and looking up his medical record from, from before, if he came in with a hand injury, you got to make it easy for the provider to look up that person's record and say, hmm, I wonder if I should give them Percocet. I wonder if they were here for other violent injuries. Even if you have a violence interrupters program in that hospital, as we did when I was practicing in Boston, you got to make sure that whatever it is that triggers that, that is easy for the provider. And so I think that's the part of, of interoperability and HIT that we often don't think about, just how can we make it as easy as possible? And then what happens when it's positive, right? What happens if that screen is positive? What do you do? When in the, I was just at a meeting about lead paint yesterday. And for we are now, um, we, we've just reduced in Baltimore City the level at which we prosecute for lead paint levels in kids. It used to be 10, and now we're dropping it from five to nine. But the problem is, even if we drop to that different level, how do we message it? I mean, our pediatricians are saying to us, we, we don't know what to do now if they scream positive. It used to be that you call this number, but now between five and nine, it's really confusing. And so I think thinking through that next step of the implementation is really important. The second issue, going back to heroin, you know, I'm, I've always maintained it because I'm, I'm this is my first job in government. I've never been in government before. I'm a policy per or I'm a science person. You know, I, I'm a physician. I go according to science and evidence. At the same time, I think that there is a role for us to always consider the politics of what we're doing at that point in time. And what I mean by this is right now, to talk, if I started the conversation about heroin use in Baltimore City from the standpoint of access to care, immediately they are the NIMBY, the not in my backyard folks who are going to stand up. But not only that, I heard another acronym that I thought was particularly telling, BANANA, which is don't build anything near anything that's near anything. <laughs> and so, and it's so true that this is what you see when people are like, well, in my backyard there are 20 clinics, I mean, wh whatever that is, even trying to convince people with numbers at, at a certain point isn't effective because they start shutting you out. But right now in our city, even in our state with a Republican administration, the one issue that we do talk about that seems to be politically okay to talk about is around overdose deaths. Understanding, of course, that overdose, giving somebody Narcan will save their life today, but isn't the answer to our substance addiction problem. But at least we can begin the conversation that way. So we begin, for example, our conversation about drug treatment and substance addiction by saying, last year in Baltimore City, more people died from drug and alcohol overdoses than died from homicide. And this previous year, in 2014, we had such a significant increase that we're basically, we have basically one person dying in our city every day. In our population of 620,000, we have one person dying every day from overdose. So that's how we're framing the conversation, so that we are taking into account data, but are beginning from a place that's more politically feasible. Another question. Uh, Baltimore is kind of a city of neighborhoods. And a couple years ago, I was at a meeting, I think it was sponsored by Catholic Charities, but it had the neighborhood, nonprofit, community, many churches, and everything. And, and uh, well, one of the sergeants, uh, uh, wasn't Sergeant Shriver, it was his son was the speaker, and we, and we talked about it, understanding the differences of the neighborhoods. So I think that neighborhoods, like you s said, Philip, has different other characteristics, you know, and some of them are improving, some of them are going down. Is there some way to get these nonprofit charity groups engaged with uh, the, the, the state, the, the city, or you know, maybe they are, the more than I know. It didn't seem a few years ago like that. I can address this very quickly to say that um, 
you know, there is, I think, in every city, I'm sure, same in California, same in, I used to live in St. Louis, another city of, of, of neighborhoods with the east and west side and similar issues of race and everything else, too. But um, there are silos everywhere, right? I mean, even in academia, there are just, there are silos. And so what we've been doing in the city is to look for areas of partnership. So we have a campaign started, actually, when Dr. Sharfstein was the health commissioner, called Be More for Healthy Babies. They'll look to see what happens if we unite every city agency and nonprofit and academic institution around one goal of reducing infant mortality. And within five years, we've reached the lowest level of infant mortality that we've ever had. And we just announced an unprecedented 32% drop in teen birth rates. So you're right that we are a city of neighborhoods, but at the same time, we have to harness that political will at this time to say, let's actually get everybody together towards the same goal. And that's sort of what we're trying to do with the moonshot, is pull the communities together and the services where we have health care, um, good schools, uh, better policing, uh, and help the, the community uh, pull itself together so that we can reduce the number of uh, injuries and homicides and increase the health you know, in those neighborhoods. Okay, so we'll take one more. And Thank you very much, Dr. Wen. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed your comments about pulling people together and how it, very important that is. Um, uh, it's occurred to me for a very long time that the fact that we often talk about the repeat to the emergency rooms as a problem we need to solve is, is sort of a curious approach. I mean, imagine if corporate America behaved that way and McDonald's said, we have this major problem. Here we are selling hamburgers and people come, keep coming in asking for toys. And we shouldn't be doing, we, we need to educate the public that we sell hamburgers and that we are not a toy provider. I mean, corporate America would never in a million years think that way. They would say, well, maybe Maybe we should offer a toy, maybe even give a toy for free so people come in and purchase more hamburgers. Um, and yet somehow our social services delivery ha is not thinking creatively and not thinking, thinking that way. We have emergency rooms and they are places where people um, go for, for medical care. And I'm wondering what would it take and what are the obstacles to, re to redefine what an emergency room is? And so instead of the answer being, well, you know, we have so little time as doctors to treat patients, that we actually redefine what our emergency rooms are, and so that instead of treating this as a problem, that our customers, you know, th instead of treating this as a problem, that people are coming to the emergency rooms for the wrong reasons, we start looking at it as an opportunity of, of our customers keep coming back, and we now have a fantastic opportunity to serve their needs. I think you've said that so well, um, and you've identified, I think, two different paradoxes in medicine. Right, so the first is the fee-for-service kind of perverse incentives. That on the one hand, we're telling people, don't come to the ER because you should go to your primary care doctor, we're going to make your copay higher if you come to, to see us in the, in, in the emergency department. But at the same time, that is what, not in Maryland, which I'll talk about, but in other places, this is the model for healthcare. It is actually helpful to bill somebody for a higher level of care visit. It's helpful to bill somebody for a procedure that may or may not be necessary. Hence, we have a situation where 30% of all tests and treatments done, according to the Institute of Medicine, are unnecessary to the tune of $750 billion per year. So I think that's one issue. And the second issue is when we talk about high utilizers, we usually say that, as you mentioned, in a bad way, right? We don't say this in a, oh, it's so great that you're a repeat customer, we're going to serve you even better next time, we're going to, you know, we're, we're, uh, we'll improve your experience. How was it last time? How, this time? Let's make it a nine out of 10. We don't say that, and instead we say, well, you're a frequent utilizer. There's something, the implication is there's something wrong with you. There's some failure in your ability to understand instructions, some failure in your primary care doctor's ability to follow, some failure that in the system, and we see that as a failure instead of as an opportunity. So I'll say two solutions that may be of, uh, of help, and I'm not sure that, again, these are the, the, the answers, but at least this is what we're trying here in Baltimore and in Maryland. The first is that we do have a unique opportunity here, which is that we have global budgeting. And with the waiver occurring, this means that for the very first time, 
in any state across the country, that we have an opportunity to align the goals of the hospital with the goals of insurance companies, with the goals of the population, which is that every hospital is going to be paid a fixed sum at the very beginning of the year, and even if more patients keep on coming in or get hospitalized, that that's the sum that they're going to get paid. Now, of course, the challenge for us is how are we going to really make sure that patients are not penalized in the process, right? That people are actually being encouraged to get the care that they need. The second issue that I'm a huge proponent for is exactly what you said. If people are coming to us anyway, why not deliver as much as we can there? Why not have point of care HIV testing? Why not have expert and screening for substance abuse and, and mental health while people are there? Why not have violence interruption programs right in our, in our ERs? So I think that you'll see two divergent paths that many places across the country with their ERs are saying, let's cut costs by increasing copays and keeping them out. And some of, some of us in public health are thinking, how can we improve our care in ERs, as you said, to re-envision a different model where we are capturing people where they are. If this is the one place that they're coming to get care, how can we identify the people most at risk and treat them there? Okay, great. So as Daniel sort of walks up to give us the next break, I uh, just want to thank Don and Lena, both for showing why Alameda has for a long time and will continue to be a leader, and well, Baltimore, which is actually one of the earliest, if not the earliest, health departments in the country is going to continue to do that, uh, both because of the, the insights of both these individuals, but some of the things that are also going on that weren't mentioned. I mean, there are ongoing meetings in Baltimore, not with just the health commissioner, but with the presidents of our universities, our medical centers, and our foundations, and the mayor's office on a regular basis now to try to understand outcomes and how these things can be linked together. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, Alameda has been a long-term leader of bringing people together, including the universities and the go governmental agencies and the non-governmental agencies. So I think as we're thinking about the next steps in the big data, as we talked about it, the information also has to be accessible and useful by the consumers. I mean, people, people have to be using these services, and if they're supposed to come back, come back. Uh, and they may need navigators and community health workers and other folks in addition to the professionals. And those are things, that, again, it's really exciting because we're going to do this. Uh, and the one other plug for Baltimore, as many of you know, our, our mayor is now the, uh, the chair of the uh, Council of, of Mayors. Uh, so I think they'll, at least for the next year, while she, I think, continues to be, uh, uh, she was just inaugurated yesterday. Uh, Baltimore will continue to be there, and we look forward to sort of having an update uh, next year on the great progress and lessons that we've learned. So thank you, Don and Lena. <laughs>